Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the next talk of the afternoon. Uh, this is Hacking the ZX Spectrum with Ben Heck. Uh, can I ask that when we get to the Q&A session at the end, uh, if you do have a question, would you be able to come forward to the mic at the front uh, as we're running a bit short on radio mic back- batteries and I'm about to go and try and find some. Thank you. Okay, you ready? All right. All right, well, hello, everyone. Thank, thank you for coming to my talk about the ZX Spectrum. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so clearly I'm an American, and uh, it's, I'm trying really hard to say that correctly so that y'all will uh, accept it. <laughs> anyway, uh, some history. I'll give you the brief history about myself if you don't know who I am, because I don't assume that everyone does. Uh, I'm not that egotistical. Um, I'm a hacker, and I also do engineering and prototype work, usually for video game companies and systems and industry, but I also do other things such as uh, disability controllers for persons that don't have the full facility to play video games, and I also have done prototypes for point-of-sale systems and whatnot as well. Um, But what I kind of got started with uh, years ago, back in the year 2000, was, oh, my laptop made a noise, Uh, oh, a tablet, was uh, video game consoles. And at that time, I was a graphic artist, um, uh, you know, working nine to five or seven to three or whatever it was. And I was always interested in the old video game systems because when I was a kid, I had an Atari 800 computer. That was actually my first APIC computer, not the Speccy. So I know, strike one. Uh, But, uh, uh, you know, I always really liked that stuff. So when I was older, in my 20s, I thought, okay, so now I've got my full-time job, blah, 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 working for the man. I need a hobby. So I didn't get into motorcycles or boats. I'm a geek, so I was into computers. So I thought, okay, I think I'll try to take this old Atari 2600 game console and try to shrink it down and make it portable. And this was, you know, 14 years ago. There wasn't a whole lot of hacker space movement or any. I mean, it, was, it existed, obviously, but not like it does today. So there wasn't as much information on the Internet, so I kind of had to shotgun a lot of it and, uh, you know, throw Hail Marys. Oh, there I just used two American analogies, sorry. Uh, but it still worked out pretty well. And as the years went by, I started doing other things like working with the newer consoles like Xbox 360, making the accessibility controllers, as I mentioned, and various other things. So in 2010, we started doing the Ben Heck Show, named after myself. I thought Circuit Breakers would have been a cooler title, but I was overruled, ironically. It's like, no, you have to name it after yourself. I'm like, okay. Uh, Anyway, so on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, well, it's now a weekly show, and you can get on Element 14 on YouTube, where we take requests from viewers, such as you, or future viewers, such as those of you who are like, oh, this guy is not a complete jerk. I think I'll watch his show in the future. Anyway, uh, project ideas, like, oh, you should build this, you should build this, oh, this would be a cool project, you should try to build this. And as long as it's reasonable and interesting, you know, we'll have a go at it, because we love new ideas that are fun and challenging and, you know, look good on camera. So I'd done projects using most of the old 8-bit computers in the past. Uh, I'd done, um, you know, things with the Atari 800, Commodore 64, Apple II GS, and uh, I think that's about it for the old computers. And one that I was always interested in working with was the, the ZX Spectrum. Okay, and we had this, uh, I don't know where it came from, like I think someone just gave it to me because it was fairly worthless, at least in in the States, but we had a Timex Sinclair, which is kind of like the rebadged, gimped import version of it, and I was like, what is this thing? It was, I kind of liked how small it was, I didn't even think it was a real computer, to be quite honest, sacrilege, right? Uh, And I don't know, I had that laying around, it probably still is like in my parents' basement someplace back home, but... uh, um, so then once, you know, I got more into hacking and started, like, reading more about the computers, I'm like, oh, there's a much better version of this. Like, the fully formed version was the ZX Spectrum with 48K starting at 16. But it basically looked like the same thing. And it was a Z80-based system that uh, was pretty interesting. And I really thought it was cool how small it was. So um, one of our fans in, uh, I believe, Ireland, he, I don't know, Twittered me. Is that a verb? Earlier this year, he's like, hey, uh, I will send you one if you do something cool with it, which is usually what people say. And as long as people want to send me small items that don't take up a lot of room, I'm all for it. So I'm not quite like Dave Jones when it comes to that. I like minimal things. Uh, yeah, and then I love getting rid of it, like going around the shop, like, yeah, goodbye, 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 goodbye. It's really, I just like take, getting rid of stuff like that. Anyway, so he sent us one. 
And I'm like, okay, this is really cool. I mean, the thing is already really small. I think it'd be cool to make a really small portable unit of it, which I have with me. Um, afterwards, I know I don't really have any flashy slides because I was too lazy to prepare them. Uh, but afterwards, uh, we do a short question and answer. If you want to come up and take a closer look at the um, Specky Portable, that's, that's super cool. We can come up here and have a fireside chat, even though there's no fire. Uh, yeah, so I was like, okay, I'm going to start working with this. So as far as hacking it, I obviously had to learn about the system. And, you know, I obviously knew how the 8-bit computer architectures typically work. The Spectrum, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it was a little different where it had two different, well, I don't want to say two different buses of RAM, but kind of two different buses of RAM. Are, are, how many of you are super familiar with the Spectrum? Or, this guy is okay. Uh, yeah, so... Do you guys actually care about this kind of geeky stuff? Oh, this is, this is a geeky conference. <laughs> I'm going to bore you with it. <laughs> so the Spectrum was supposed to, obviously it was meant to be cheap, and it was spectacularly cheap, if you ask me, but that's awesome. And I don't just mean the keyboard. Everything about it was stripped down. It had, I don't want to know, I'm going to say how much. Like normally, let's say you had like your Apple II or your... Atari 800, and they have like all this RAM expansion you could put in. In order to address it, it would have a 74 series logic where it would say, okay, well, if this address line and this address line, but not this address line, then we'll activate this bank of RAM, and so on and so forth. And the Spectrum had that too. It was the old school where you'd have, you know, nowadays we'd have one, well, <laughs> nowadays, it's, RAM would be not anywhere near that, but it would have something like eight, yes, eight one-bit RAM chips, and that would give you, well, there was two banks. There was a 16K bank and a 32K bank, and you add those numbers up, and you get your 48K specy. And it was kind of interesting how it used the separate banks. It kind of reminded me of the Nintendo Entertainment System, which had something similar. It had a separate bus for its video than for its CPU. So what I had to do, and this is what is so great about the internet now, which I always say in my talks is like, you know, the, the greatest things in sliced bread. USB is also pretty cool. Uh, I was able to go online, and of course, there's a worldspectrum.org. And I don't know if this is where I found the schematics from, but uh, I definitely, I was able to, you know, obtain the schematics. And they had like, I think I had like, I actually, when I built this, I used two different sets of schematics in order to compile it. So inside of the spectrum, let's see if I can know this from memory, there's a Z80, there's a ULA, which is the video chip, there's eight RAM chips for the video, eight RAM chips for the, um, for the CPU, as it were. Then there's a complex logic chip, which is a bunch of 74 series logic pulled into one dip 40. Uh, no, no, there's a TI chip. I don't know if it's TI that does the um, YUV to, what would it be, PAL? And then there's a ROM. Did I get everything? Anyway, I wanted to, I didn't want to use that specialized dip 40. What they basically did there is, I think, if you look at the older schematics, like the version 2 schematics, in order to do the RAM addressing for the CPU and the ULA, I'm just going to consider them separate things, that I believe six different, it was either six gates or six 74 series logic chips, I can't remember. But I was like, okay, it's easier for me to wire in, you know, six common logic gates that I can get than try to scarf this custom DIP40 chip that they had made for the later revisions. Like, if you look at an older Spectrum motherboard where that big DIP40 chip is, there'll be actually like four 74 series logic chips instead of you know, like DIP16 chips. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to take this part of these schematics and wire up that, and I'm going to take this part of these schematics. So basically, I kind of combined two different types of schematics, and it did work, so yay. Uh, one thing that kind of sucked was the, uh, they had like, what did they use? Like five bit address lines. So the ULA is actually what makes a spectrum the spectrum. Uh, most old systems were like that. Uh, with the Atari 2600, it was the TIA adapter. That's what they spent all their money on developing the silicon for. That's why they had to sell, I'm talking about Atari here. That's why they had to sell their company to Time Warner so they could afford to finish it. The other two chips were just off the shelf chips. Same, excuse me, same thing with this, is that pizza out there? It was good. Same thing with the Spectrum, uh, basically all off the shelf except for the ULA, which I actually don't know what it stands for, but it's basically the video chip. And thank you, that makes sense. <laughs> and I, when I, as soon as I cracked it open, I noticed that was the only socketed chip and it got warm. So immediately, immediately I'm like, oh, this thing must have failed a lot. 
But luckily, this one didn't fail. And we were actually, uh, thanks to Chris from uh, Premier Farnell, he actually sent me an extra one. So the original Spectrum has been reconstituted. So it, it lives. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so the big trick was just going through the schematics very carefully. And for some reason, I just had this death wish to hand wire an 8-bit computer, which I'd never actually done before. I've always wanted to. And then, so I don't know if you can see it. Again, you can come up with a closer view. I put a window in the back of this for two reasons. A, to show the insane wiring, and B, to prove that it wasn't like an FPGA emulation of, well, emulation is not the right word, but, you know, to show that it was real. And again, we can show this in more detail later. But how I did it as far as wiring up this computer. So I basically copied the Spectrum over, but I used the original one as a blueprint and a test bed, so to speak. I would wire up, for instance, uh, the Z80 and its RAM and the ROM, which is really, that's a, Z80, uh, that's a Z80 computer right there. I wired that up here. I don't know if you can see if there's actually two separate circuit boards with space-consuming headers, although headers are awesome. So the top portion is basically just a single-board Z80 computer. I'm getting good at that, yeah. And I wired that up. I'm like, okay, so to test this, I'm going to put it back into its original state as well as I can. So I took this, and where the header is, I actually hooked it up to a DIP40. So I took the CPU out of the Speccy, and then I wired that top board into the CPU slot. And then I removed its RAM and its ROM to see if it would still boot up. So I only built one part at a time to mitigate the risk of failure. Because if you wire up everything, I mean, I always bring this up to you. If you wire up everything, then flip the switch and nothing happens, where's the problem? You never know, because you've done all that work. And it's like digging for the city of El Dorado to try to find the solution. So my hacking advice is build one thing, test it. Build the next thing, test it. Build the next thing, test it. Because then you almost have like an undo button. You know, it's not like Microsoft Word. You just go undo, 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 undo. Or when you're sitting there trying to compose a tweet and you're spending an hour and you can always just change it. You can't do that when you build things in reality. <laughs> Obviously. So by taking it one step at a time, it gives you a better chance of success. So I had the ROM, which is where the program comes from, like, you know, the basic and whatnot, 16K. ROM, CPU, and RAM. And then I believe I had an inverter, which was needed to do the ROM addressing, because if it's read-write, you have to set the lines. Once I had that working, I had it as an own board, then I connect that into the spectrum. Okay, this part works. Then the tricky part, well, more time-consuming part, was to make the video half of the, of the ZX Spectrum project. And... Like I mentioned before, the video is really what makes it a ZX Spectrum. I mean, you could put in a Texas Instrument video chip, and it would basically be a ColecoVision or an MSX computer, as I believe they had on this side of the pond. So for that, I had to take the precious, precious ULA, which I've already forgotten the name of that you told me. Something Logic Array? OK, that makes sense. <laughs> And we have a very clever coloring scheme, but I won't bore you with that because I'm sure most of you know how that worked. Anyway, so on the bottom half of it, I made the video portion. And it has the ULA and then its RAM. And I didn't use the, uh, uh, the single bit eight parallel RAM chips. I got a modern 32K uh, RAM from uh, well, on the States, Newark slash Element 14. And it was pretty simple to hook up, but you had to do the Oh, gosh, how does it work? Uh, <laughs> the ULA addresses its own RAM using uh, two stages of an address. So you have, like, the first five bits of the address. It will load that. Then it will strobe it. And then you'll load the next five stages. And you can't, that doesn't, that's not how modern RAM works, or at least, you know, remotely modern RAM. Oh, I think the original RAM wasn't, it wasn't static either. It was dynamic. That's okay, because the Z80, sorry, Z80 <laughs> takes care of that. <laughs> hey, I'm batting pretty good here. <laughs> So what is it, a zebra? Like if there's a spotted horse or striped horse, that's... Really? Whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, the Z80 part of it, the, the CPU, you can attach RAM to that perfectly normally, you know, a 16 line... Or I actually, it wasn't 16 bits of address. It was like 15, because it only sees 32K. And then, you know, your eight lines of data. Oh, excuse me, that pizza was spicy. And <laughs> then you actually uh, combine the uh, data lines with uh, resistors so they could be separated. But what's interesting, as I went through the schematics, and I had to find, like, the right speed transistors because you can't just take, like, some 
I can't remember the number off of my head. Like, you know, the bog standard NPN transistor doesn't work. I had to find a modern equivalent that was still a through-hole resistor that I could solder. I mean, there's some surface mount on here, but not a whole lot. Actually, there is, although, well, I guess I just contradicted myself. You'll see it in person when you come up. Uh, but anyway, we had to find a transistor that had the right switching speed because the ULA, which I, I've heard stands for Universal Logic Array. Nice. <laughs> it actually drives the CPU, which is kind of interesting. So this isn't too geeky. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, I have, I have friends. Most of my friends are like IT. I mean, I have a few engineer friends, but I even start talking about this, and their eyes glaze over, and they're like, and the walking dead or something. Uh, oh, yeah, we're doing, we're doing okay on time. Excuse me. Uh, I just completely forgot my train of thought while making up those analogies. <laughs> oh, yeah, how the clock works, yeah. So there's a 14 megahertz crystal on there that's divided by 2 to create the PAL color burst. Then that's divided by 2 again to drive the clock of the CPU, which is 3.5 megahertz, which is actually, I believe, faster than the Super Nintendo, which was slow. Didn't have blast processing. So what happens is when the ULA is accessing the memory in order to draw the screen, which of course it does, I would assume, 50 times a second, it actually prevents the Z80 from accessing the same RAM or even operating so you, know, you don't have collisions. So it was really fun doing all that. And then I also, I really wanted, I thought about, there's people that have FPGA in, uh, in implementations of the ULA, so it acts as a drop-in replacement, since the ULA is unobtainium, as I use that word correctly, not like the movie Avatar did. And uh, <laughs> so, but then I'm like, well, if I'm going to put an FPGA in there, why don't I just do the whole system on FPGA? FPGA? Then I'm like, no, I must stand firm. I'm going to plop that ULA in there, but I added a heat sink, because that sucker got warm. Actually, all told, it's only about 400 milliamps, which isn't too horrible for an old system. And so I did actually rewire the entire analog video circuit. So it, this is a uh, cheap little backup camera for your car that you can get from Amazon.com. It's like 15 US dollars, probably about $22 uh, here, pounds, I'm sorry. 22 pound dollars. <laughs> it's the new, new universal currency, the dollar, pound, euro, quid. <laughs> Euro quid sounds like some sort of sea beast that would attack ships. <laughs> it's the Euro quid. Whoosh, whoosh, soon coming to soon to a theater near you. Anyway, <laughs> so it basically outputs a PAL signal just like it always did and drives this. Uh, so if you get like an LCD nowadays, no matter where you get it, they usually can take at least PAL and NTSC, if not CCAM as well. So it actually has a PAL signal on it. RGB would have been nice, but this camera was cheap and it fit. And the idea was to make it as small as possible. So I did that, and uh, yes, I guess, oh, I, I'm managing to talk quite a bit, so I will, I will move along.org. So in the back here, we have uh, two 3.7-volt uh, lithium-ion cells, and the charger circuit, these are just fairly generic ones that you can get. You charge it here. There's a power switch, which, you know, that's an improvement on the original ZX Spectrum. <laughs> Seriously, it's like, well, let's see, 10 cents times 6 million is, phew, bugger that. <laughs> <laughs> Remove everything until it stops working. <laughs> Engineering 101. Uh, cassette, it still uses the cassette. Um, we, do, we did this as a, as, a, as a project on our show. And we did it in three, our show is every week, and we did it in three episodes over the course of the summer. So we had June, July, and August. So, you know, there's only a certain amount of time I had to work on it, although it was usually more time than we had. Had I had more time, I probably would have tried to build my own uh, implementation of, what was it called, the, uh, the RAM loader star path, multi-face, is that it? Okay. So you can basically do a RAM dump, and, you know, you could... Basically, dump RAM to SD card and load it back in, whatever, have a save state. But the tape's kind of quaint, too. And actually, yeah, as my talk draws to a close, I'll load up something on it for your amusement. And then down at the bottom, I just have a uh, slide switch. Uh, I don't think you can even get a, a 16K EEPROM anymore. I always like to say EEPROM and EPROM. So I said that wrong. I would say EPROM. So erasable, programmable, read-only memory, not electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. Oh, it's nice to be so geeky. Not have to un-geek un myself. Yeah, that computer uses the electrical bits that go into the data. 
And that's how it works. Oh, okay, I get that now. Yeah, we'll write the article about that. <laughs> so, did you ever, ever come, have conversations with that? And or you had to be like Sherlock Holmes, like you meet someone. And you're like, well, madam, I can tell that you know nothing about 8-bit computers, but you do know everything about molecular biology. Therefore, I'm going to say this to you. You know, you have to kind of edit yourself on the fly so what you can talk about. But here I can say any sort of geeky crap I want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to start a load here. la da 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 So this is basically just an app you can get off the App Store, Redundant, or Android Player, whatever they call it. And it takes uh, the zip files and basically... it basically turns this into the world's most complex cassette deck. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually have two ROMs on this. I put in a 32K APROM, which is the ones you use with EV, although it's a UV, although it's a, it's a one-shot app now. So it has, on the lower 16K, it has the original Spectrum ROM, and on the upper 16K, it has a custom ROM that was on the World Spectrum site called Gosh Wonderful, where you can actually type in Keywords, you don't have to like do all the, you know, J for load, which makes no sense. Oh, because L is for let. It's like on the basic on this, you actually have to type let. I was like, <gasps> mind blown. So I'm going to do the load command, and then, it, yes, it will make the noise. Manic Miner, I believe, works. Okay. And you can, right? All the, get ready for this. All right. Yeah. This is what you all want to hear, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the title screen is is titling or whatever. So, so see see how I'm tapping my finger here. I'm not just trying to keep the beat. Uh, the tablet, any excuse to shut off and not run out of batteries because it's an Android device, it'll take. So if I don't keep tapping, it, it'll like reduce its volume and then yes, tape loading error. So when I had a BBC interview, and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. He probably thought I was a nervous tick, but no. Because last night, I was like, okay, i got to make sure this thing loads in one shot. And Clive Sinclair is like, it'll never work, boy. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I kind of picture he's like in this castle, like uh, Mrs. Havisham or, uh, or Citizen Kane, who I should know the first name of, Charles Foster Kane. You know, the, with like a snow globe. And the snow globe has a spectrum inside of it, of course. And then he's like, oh, I know he's still alive. And he'd say something as he dropped it to the floor in black and white. Anyway, it's still loading. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then I, I, I kind of pictured it like this. Um, this young lad would go there. He's like, you're going to work at the, ha not Havisham Castle, the Spectrum Castle. And he's like, yes, I will. And then he's like, what are you doing? And there's a fireplace. We're still working on the script. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so it loads just like the original one did. I actually had to do a few. Um, I couldn't copy the analog audio loading circuit exactly because it didn't quite work with modern, I don't want to call it a tape deck, but modern equipment. So I actually had to make a few adjustments. The thing I find so amazing about this is the same circuit that makes the beeps and boops, the same circuit takes in the audio from your tape deck. I mean... I guess anything to save a buck, but I, I had to say, I know I've said it's kind of cheap, but I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's very impressive. Like, so you have, like, a, on your CPU, you can access a port, which is not necessarily the same thing as a RAM location. And usually on those, it would be, like, 255 ports, like, you know, 00 to FF. And, you know, a lot of computers had all sorts of ports, you know, parallel ports. and like, No, not the Spectrum. It had one port, FE. And it did everything. So if you wanted to read the keyboard, you would actually, you know, FE would be the two lower, or I'm sorry, the, the lower byte, and then you'd have the top eight bytes would tell you which keyboard you want, row you wanted to scan. So you'd actually pulse the address lines to scan the keyboard. And then you also use that same byte. One of the bits did the beeps and boops all on one byte. And if you read it or wrote it, it did different things. So right now it's reading that location through the ULA to load the tape program, which should be done. You're going to hear this really loud music here. All right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Huh. Look, Mom, I got it to load. Oh, man, this is really loud. 
Okay, so I think we have about 15 minutes left, so I guess I will answer some questions. I'm going to push this button. Okay, hold on. Be quiet, game. Okay, now I'm going to pause the game. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, yeah, so I guess um, some questions, the microphone or whatever, and then anyone that wants to come up and take a look at it closely is free to do so. Okay, so... Uh, oh, 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 yeah, so if you want... That's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? It's like... I guess just, how about just yell really loudly if you have a question about how I did this or why I did this. How many hours? How many hours? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's fine. I'm sorry, how many hours did I spend on it? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, gosh, hours, it's... It wasn't too dear, maybe 40 to 50. Um, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't have a, much trouble doing this. It's time consuming, if anything. It's, it's actually kind of relaxing. Like if I was 30 years older, I, this would have been a ship in a bottle or something like that. But for me, it's, it's wiring. And I always use the, uh, it, you don't see it anymore, but the Ultra ATA solid ribbon cable that computers used around about 2002. Because it's very thin, it's single strand. You can uh, do differential signaling with it, not like this needs it. Uh, and so I always go to computer shops and just hoard all the garbage, and I, I call it recycling. But it's the only way to get that stuff anymore. And then I, I love to use it for this. And I also use it when I do uh, timing latency controllers for the video game companies, such as uh, Rockstar and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we have like 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, so any more questions, and then we can take a look. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, I guess we could find one in the field and do a scientific <laughs> test. I'll tell you what, though, I, I actually was a little superstitious about this. You know, I thought maybe we could get some shielding about it. I definitely try to keep it away from my legs or whatnot. Uh, it kind of depends. I think some of these images are botched, but you have to have the volume. Like, like that's why I brought my tablet. I have an Android phone as well, but it's even more inconsistent. So, it's like, if you take one of the tablets, you turn it all the way up. You have the cable. It doesn't actually use the stereo. It just uses the left, which was you know you know mono originally. Uh, so I did, I've, I've actually, even after I finished this on the show, I continue to tweak it. It's like usually when we get done with the project on the show, I'm like, goodbye. But um, with this one, I really wanted to make sure it was perfect. And even like last Sunday, I found a loose wire on the RAM. I'm like, oh my gosh, I almost brought this to England like that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so yeah, if you can, you know what, ironically, if you can keep the two gigahertz quad core this away, cannot power down, it actually loads pretty reliably. But again, if I had more time, I'd put in an SD loader. Mouse farts, huh? So were there, were there, like, super, were there like superstitious um, um, rituals that, you know, you all would use where it's like, you know, you'd rub sage over it and have a chicken bone and then... <laughs> yeah, don't breathe. <laughs> uh, yeah, we still have about 14 minutes, so uh, yeah, I'm game for more questions. I know you probably all want to see it closer up, but... <laughs> No, I didn't try to. Someone has done that, actually. Was that you? No. Oh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay, this sh I'm, I don't want to turn off Manic Miner. I'll just let it sit there. You know, it's completely off subject, but I got the, that TRS-80 Model 100 recently, that, that white box thing. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And that thing is awesome. You're like, you can turn it off, and it has a NICAD that'll, st that'll store the RAM. I love that thing. That's, that's my new toy. Anyway, uh, wait, I can remember your question. Oh, yes. So I had, I had a couple thoughts. Um, someone had written uh, emulation for the ULA using the parallax propeller, which I have a lot of those laying around. I thought about using that because I was in a bind. I thought, oh, is the ULA toast? Because you don't know. I mean, I know the ULA was notoriously, you know, notoriously bad for braking, probably because it was so warm. So it goes back to, okay, what did I do wrong? Did I just wire something wrong? Did I do the video analog circuit wrong? Because it's digital and analog. As far as doing it with um, discrete logic, yes, I know. I saw someone had this big breadboard. They had done it. I mean, why would you do that when you could do an FPGA or CPLD? 
Uh, yeah, but there was a slight moment of panic. Well, not really panic, but I'm like, oh, crap. You know, I hope I didn't spend a little time wiring it, then it'll be, you know, botched. But luckily, it was all right. Um, but if I were to do it again, yeah, I'd still do it with all the original logic. But maybe use a surface mount uh, Z80 processor, use more surface mount 74 series logic, actually make a PCB. I know it's weird, like, well, oh, I, there's like this, I don't know, I need a term for it, maybe you could help me with this. It's like the point where, like, oh, I'll just wire this one prototype by hand, how much time that takes, or I could have just designed it and had a PCB made. Because if sometimes you think you're going to save time by wiring it by hand, nope. <laughs> you, you could wait two weeks from China to get the boards and it'd be faster. Ah, <sighs> oh, yeah, so mouse farts as well. <laughs> and the mouse is like, oh, dear, I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes. If any more questions or if you want to head up. Oh, yes, sir. Which is best, Spectrum or Commodore 64? <laughs> 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 <sighs> <sighs> yeah, the Spectrum had a higher clock speed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, this, and it was cheaper. This is, see, I'm giving you a very political answer here. Because, well, yeah. Hey, I had an Atari 800, and that thing was a dog compared to either of them, so. But it was awesome. Uh, yeah, oh, yes, sir. Yes, that's your other national computer, right? And it led to the, uh... <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> But that led to ARM, so, you know, it was no small, it was no small part of history. I mean, it was from the great small acorn, <laughs> I like it, grew a great oak. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I, I think, I'm trying to get through all the 8-bit computers. Uh, I might actually do something with the ST or the Amiga next, uh, but I might swing around to the, because, I mean, the Spectrum is already pretty obscure outside of um, London or England, so, yeah, someday, maybe. Again, kind of a political answer. Yes, sir. So it can load? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're. I'm. I'm just trying to remember. I had to remove a few inline uh, passives. I believe there's. Again, this has been about a month or a half ago since I did this. I had to remove a few inline passives, change some pull-ups to be a lower value, and uh, that's about it. But I was pretty worried. But if you just, if you just, of course, it's, it's all surface mount when you all come up and take a look. Uh, if you just take the schematic at face value, yeah, it wouldn't load through this. But it was basically one of those things where I just uh, removed parts until it worked. <laughs> Go back to that old, old Dodge, yeah. Because I'm not really that good at analog. I'm more of a digital guy, but I was able to power through it. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? I know you should, probably all should come up and take a look. That's better than the questions, probably. But, oh, yes, sir. Again, I didn't, I didn't really have one back in the day, so at the moment. Uh, I like Galaxian because it loads quickly for demonstrations. <laughs> Every answer I give you, I sound like a politician, don't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, any more quick questions before we can wrap it up? And, uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, did security at the airport make you boost it up? <laughs> <laughs> It was in my check bag. But I had a piece of tape over it so it wouldn't actually turn itself on. I've actually designed uh, portable 3D printers. I did one for PrinterBot. And I've actually taken that and stuck it in the luggage rack. And uh, they, what did they ask? Well, it was in America. It was, uh, it was like, they're like, oh, what's that? It's a 3D printer. Oh, OK. I even had, I taped a 3D print to it in case I had to say, OK, this is what it does, blah, 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 no. <laughs> And then I got this great photo, you know, because just randomly taking photos of people on the airplane, you know, that's not creepy or anything. So I, you know, I was like, I put it in the bin, and I even had it measured, even if it was like a little three-seat across puddle jumper, it would still fit, which is like 13 inches or 12 inches. No, I didn't make it 13 because it's superstition. So I made it like 12. And I was a few seats back, and then this other guy comes in, and he's putting, he's like, giving it like, what the heck is that? And I'm like, oh, this is priceless. <laughs> and then I tweeted it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so, no. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I, I think you should maybe I'll come up and take a closer look. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be here, obviously, holding this thing. So thank you for coming.